Hello, everyone. I'm so happy to see all of you here today. Thank you for joining us. My name is Krupa Free. I'm the Associate Director of Imprint, and welcome to the Imprint Cool Brain Series. Um, we're so excited to be presenting the dynamic duo, Lisa Yi and Dan Sanchez, with their wonderful new novel, The, Ten the Misfits, A Royal Conundrum. How many of you can say conundrum? Um, we hope you all got a chance to do your own conundrum. Um, my colleague Amanda Ortiz was leading that activity, and I hope it got you excited about Lisa and Dan's new book. You're in for a real treat today. Um, and speaking of their new book, when many of you arrived today, you received a free signed copy. Um, which we gave to the first hundred attendees or families, one per household, considered a gift from all of us at Imprint to you. But for us as bookstore in the lobby, um, they're also selling additional copies. So feel free, um, and we encourage you to buy one of their copies. Um, let's see, what else do I need to tell you? Um, you should have received a number as well when you came, your book signing number. If you want to get your book personalized, they're all signed, um, the ones that we gave away. If you want to get your books personalized um, or have Lisa and or Dan sign another of their books, please hang on to that number and we will call you up um, in numerical order uh, in groups of 10. Let's just be nice to each other and only come up when we call you up. Um, that'd be helpful. Um, some of you also received a survey as you entered. Um, if you can, please fill that out. It's really helpful to us, um, and we would love your feedback about today's event and the series in general. Okay, so coming together to celebrate the power enjoy the books and the authors who write them, ensuring kids have access to all the great books and promoting books that help all kids see themselves in literature is why the Imprint Cool Brain series exists. The series is one of the few in the nation specifically dedicated to showcasing middle grade authors and their books. Imprint has been conducting this series for more than 15 years years. Video on demand um, of past recordings of these events are available on the Imprint website. Go to the Imprint archives. Our web address is imprint.org. You'll find videos of Jerry Crash, Kate DeTamillo, Alan Grant, Meg Medina, Archie Palacio, and many others, including Ben Santat's um, previous imprint event, which he did virtually during the pandemic for the Aquanox. So, um, also on our website, imprint.org, you can learn more about our workshop and everything we do. Okay, so now it's time to thank everybody. Um, there are many people we want to thank who make this series possible. We owe big thanks to our lead underwriters. Um, of this series, including HEB, the National Endowment for the Arts, for their generous support, as well as the, as well as the Houston ISD Foundation. Imprint also receives support from the Jerry C. Deering Family Foundation, Houston Endowment, the City of Houston through the Houston Arts Alliance, and the Texas Commission on the Arts. Thanks to all of them, this series remains free of charge and we're able to put books by writers like Lisa and Dan in your hands for free. We are also very grateful to Meyerland Performing and Visual Arts Middle School for hosting this series, especially the principal here, and our wonderful librarian and friend, Celeste Cooper. Yes, let's give her a hand. Also, a special thank you to Taylor Tartlett Carlton, Children's Programming Director at Brazos Bookstore, and as well as Jerry Ho and Christopher Cam from Random House Children's Books. They helped 
make this event possible. Finally, we owe thanks to all of the teachers, all of the librarians and school administrators, the parents who made it possible for all of us to come together. Um, we are thrilled as well that today we have Bobby Shaw Middle School here with us. Now, everybody I name, thank you all today. Okay, now we go on to the main event. So Newberry Honoree and National Book Award finalist Lisa Yi is the author of more than 20 novels. Wow. Um, including Maisie Chen's Last Camp, National Book Award winner and health Hop medalist Dan Santek is the author of 100 books. Wow. Wow. Including the memoir, which he just won the National Book Award for, um, A First Time for Everything. So that's a lot of books between the two of them. So here, I'm going to give you all a conundrum, okay? Listen to my question carefully. How many of you have read a book by either Lisa or Dan? I want to see a show of hands. Okay, here is the second part of the conundrum. How many of you have read a book we sent to Dan? Any hands? Because they have written stuff together. Ooh, I see some hands. Okay. Well, even if you haven't read a book by both of them, you're about to. The Misfits is written by Lisa Yee and illustrated by Dan Santab. For the third week, the book remains on the New York Times bestseller list. Self-awareness calls the book full of action, adventure, and fun. And the Horn book describes it as an enter entertaining mystery. But really beyond that, The Misfit is a book about friendship. It's a book about being okay with who you are. And also understanding that each of us, whether we know it or not, has a superpower. And you'll discover it if you just stay patient and wait. So now, let's silence our cell phones and please no flash photos during the presentation. And let's give them a warm Houston welcome. <laughs> Hello. Can you, is yours work? Yeah. Yes. Can you Thank hear you me? very much, everybody. Can you hear you? Um, I'm Lisa, as you can tell. Well, maybe you can't tell. I'm Lisa. That was Dan. Before we start, I want to ask you guys a favor. Can you yell when I count to three? Oof, oof, oof. Do you think you guys can do that? Okay, remember, I'm going to count to three. Okay, one, two, three. Oof, oof, oof. I like, I like that, that, that. You guys are amazing. So. Um, Dan and I have been friends for 22 years. 22 years, and so like we like to be really casual, so we thought we'd be very casual, like friends. About, yeah, so and what, just what was the first like, time we met? We, were, we met at a book conference. Right? We met 22 years ago before either one of us was published. And we both wanted to create books. Yeah, our first editor was Arthur Levine. And he, he's the editor of the Harry Potter series. So we both started out on a very strong foot. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and so he ended up being, being our editor. And then we lived near each other. So we started having lunch about once a week. And yeah. then so that was like I over 20 years ago. I think kind of amazing saying that, you, you know, because being a writer and an illustrator could be a very, you know, isolated kind of living where you're at home. but to occasionally get the opportunity to work with your bunch buddy friend, you know, and be on tour. We've been on tour for 19 days, so this is the last word. So you can, week. you can tell by the bags under yeah. my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, what a way to end it. I mean, we are, yeah. we are ending our tour here in Houston with you guys. So thank you so much for coming out on a Sunday. <laughs> it's, it's a beautiful day out there. Wait, lock the door so they don't leave. But it is a beautiful day out there. We're flying back to LA where a huge storm is. And we're flying in. into the storm. We're flying in when, it, like, you don't understand. If the half inch in LA, all of LA turns into like. Everybody know, panics. Walking dead. Everybody it's panics. crazy. Yeah. It's going to be six inches of rain. Yeah. Like yeah. 32 we're gonna, hours. We're gonna, yeah. 
So, good times, good times. So the Misfits, um, originally I had this idea, and I think I had told Dan about it, about um, crime-fighting ballerinas, right? And the book was going to be called Ball Ballerina Battalion, but it started changing because I started thinking about, like, so I wrote the DC Superhero Girls series, if any of you are familiar with that, the DC Superhero Girls books. And I started thinking about how um, all of them had superpowers, except for Batgirl, who I love. It doesn't have superpowers, but she's just really brilliant. And I thought, what if I were to write a series about kids who are heroes, but they didn't have any superpowers? In fact, they had the opposite of superpowers. What if they were loners? Because I was kind of a loner when I was a kid. I was, like, I could be like right here sitting among you in an audience and feel like I was all by myself, you know, that, that nobody could see me or at lunch. I could be sitting in the cafeteria and I'd be looking at everybody else, looking like they were having a good time and there I was all by myself. And so I kind of felt like I was invisible, but I thought, okay, what if I wrote about these five different kids and they all felt invisible? But if you're a super secret crime fighter, right? Being invisible is one of the best things that you could be. So I thought about these five awkward kids who come together in this really strange boarding school. It's on this island. It looks like Alcatraz in San Francisco. And they're sort of recruited to become crime fighters and they solve the crime of the century. And so my, my question is why San Francisco? What are you thinking of Alcatraz and then the setting of San Francisco? Well, Alcatraz, so if you don't know what Alcatraz is, it's this this huge island off of, we're well not huge, it's a small island off of San Francisco, it's on a rock, and it was this high security prison. And so when I was a kid, I remember going there on a tour and thinking, oh, this is kind of cool, I want to live here, but I hadn't committed any crimes at that point. So, uh, I, I mean, I can relate to it's, that. Really, it's really cool if you Google Not if you were a prisoner back in the day, of course. Not if you were a prisoner. But no, I mean, they have, it's gorgeous. It's actually really gorgeous, and then, um, I'm from, I was born and raised in Los Angeles, and we go to San Francisco all the time, and I love San Francisco and Ghir Ghirardelli chocolate. You've heard of Ghirardelli chocolate, right? There's actually the Ghirardelli Square where you have the Ghirardelli hot fudge sundaes, and we, we went there yeah, earlier we this week for, for research and had hot fudge sundaes because we had to do it. Coit Tower. And we went to Coit Tower, which is going to be in book two. We yeah. went on the trolleys, and it's all for research. It's all for research. We have, we have to do that. Yeah, yeah. But, but you've been to San Francisco a bunch of I've been right? to San Francisco. I have family like not that doesn't live too far from there. But yeah, I, I did. When I read the manuscript, I uh, took a tour of Alcatraz. And I had always wanted to go to Alcatraz to, to take a tour. Um, you know, we have a mutual friend, Jennifer Choldenko, who used to be a tour guide there. Right. Right. So Alcohol does my shirts. She, she Yeah. So she gave me some tips on what to see and what to keep an eye out on. And I, I went on the tour of Alcatraz. It was amazing. If any of you go to San Francisco, it's definitely worth the trip. Um, but yeah, took photos of, of everything. Um, and then there was a submarine in the book that you completely forgot what was in the book. Uh, I tried toward that submarine, which was pretty fantastic. So we were we were doing an interview, and Dan's talking, and he says, "Well, you know, the submarine in in the book." And I'm like, "Well, there's no submarine in the book." He's like, "Yes, there's." And you know what? He's right. There is a submarine in the book. But you know what happens is like I'm I've already finished the second book, and the first book just came out. So I'm thinking, so you know, I, I get I get mixed up, I get confused. You know, the craziest part of touring the tour uh, the the submarine is that you go inside and it's how efficient they are with their space and and it might be a little unsettling because i remember climbing down into the submarine and then you know you have the torpedo launchers in the front but then you have a bunk bed right above a torpedo yeah like where do you put the people Oops. to sleep like wherever there's room and i can't think of anything more disheartening than to sleep above a torpedo but you know that's yeah, well, so like in the, in the Misfits, in Misfits book one, um, they have to have all these kind of tests that they go through and they're practicing. And so one of them takes place where there's a missile that's going to hit a submarine and they have, to, they have to stop it. And so, I mean, these are kids that, you know, just a few months prior were just in their middle schools being ignored by everybody. And then they all come together on this mysterious island. They right. take a bunch of tests and they're, they're put together for this super secret crime fighting agency called Knock, 
which is no one can know. Do you want to give them a quick summary of who the characters are? So, okay, so there are five characters. And so these are the illustrations. Why don't you explain this, though, Dan, what, uh, what they're yeah. seeing? So who here has ever messed with an iPad? Of course you have. It's 2024. <laughs> uh, how many of you are familiar with a program called Procreate? Okay, so... Um, I'm, I'm old school. I'm an old school artist. I, used to, I usually work on Photoshop, but uh, I've been traveling a lot, so I've had to do a lot of the final line artwork on Procreate, which is an industry standard these days. There's a lot of artists that just have an iPad and, and Procreate, and they do final artwork for books just using that. I, it's very, I'm very unfamiliar with it. A lot of it is muscle control, and when you're using that really great you know, Apple Pencil on the surface. You're, it's like drawing on ice because it's a glass surface. Anyway, um, Procreate's a fantastically powerful tool for only 12 bucks. Uh, and if you wanted to become an illustrator yourself, get that and you're open for business. But um, this is a playback. What, what's great about Procreate is that it does a playback of all the art that you work on. So you're literally seeing all the things that I did to get to the final product. I mean, this has been sped up. Considerably, I would say the final art for something like this probably took me about two and a half, maybe three hours. And these are the these are the pictures that are actually in your books. Yeah. And this is me, like you know, I'm doing I'm doing various things. I'm, I'm either at my kid's soccer game working on a book, or maybe uh, you know spending quality time with my wife, uh, watching watching hours of House Hunters and Real Housewives of Atlanta, which I do not like. So I'm just sitting there and being like, oh, okay, you go with house number three, you know. <laughs> but in the meantime, like, I'll be working on this. And what's great about it is that, you know, I, I, can, I, can, I can work from anywhere as long as I have a Wi-Fi signal. Uh, and so I get the manuscript. Like, yeah, so, so there, are, there are five misfits. Uh, the main one is Olive, and she is great at, um, she's a great at acrobatics and gymnastics because her grandmother has trained her for that. And the thing was that when I was Olive's age, I remember doing gymnastics and in school and falling on my head and I ended up at the hospital. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna write about that. Only I'm gonna make her really good at it, right? I mean, the great thing about being an author is you can take stuff that's happened in your real life and then make, make the kids so much better than you are. But all of, like, she's, she's a loner. I was, I was a loner when I was growing up and she has a lot of allergies. She's very allergic to cats. And so I thought, well, what if we took these weird things that the kids had that they were embarrassed about, but made them positive, right? So having allergies is actually a plus in the book. And then we have another kid named Theo, and um, he's like, you probably all know of him. He's very chill, he's very laid back, right? And he has this skill that I have still never mastered, and that is he can talk to grown-ups. He can talk to any grown-up, he can talk to anyone, and he's the type of person, maybe you've met people like this, that you end up just telling like your whole life story to. That's Theo, he can get anyone to tell them anything. We have Phil, she's, a, she's a, like a technology genius. She's got these big rings on her hand that are actually computers that she uses, and she also makes up gadgets, and I thought, okay, so like, I remember, remember the toys from when I was a kid. Do you remember Silly String, and I think it's still around, right? Silly string. So they have something that's kind of like silly string, only it's super powerful and it could tie up people, right? And so it's like, uh, and, uh, and like I thought, okay, what if there was a spray that these misfits used, like if they were tailing someone and, and the person was trying to get away and they had a stink spray and all they have to do is spray the person and you can't get the stink off of you and it's easy to find them. So it's like Phil is coming up with these kinds of things. There's a character named Iggy and she's like, um, she's very negative. She's very she's negative. In, uh, I would she's say very, she's aggressive. She's very aggressive, but yeah. she's great at combat and fighting because they all, they're all trained in um, ballet and boxing and mixed martial arts. And then there's James, he's this genius who loves battleship. So what I did is, I have these characters, I have the manuscript, and I do like just a little couple of sentences about who these characters are, and then I give them to Dan. And then he's gonna interpret that and come up with what they look like. Right, um, you know, having, having drawing, like, I have a degree in microbiology that I don't use. But luckily, luckily I've spent my, most of my childhood drawing pictures of things that I like, starting with Garfield, and then moving up to Calvin and Hobbes, and then eventually I really got into Marvel Comics, uh, because I had reading comprehension issues, so I had a hard time reading books, 
And so I went to graphic novels and just fell in love with reading. So yay, yay, yay comic books. Um, but a lot of my education just happened to be me copying those pictures of things that I like, Spider-Man, X-Men, things like that. And you can probably see it. You can probably see a little bit indicative in, in, in the line work that I'm doing here. Anyway, so of course, I go get a four-year degree in microbiology. Uh, I, I, I get accepted into dental school, and then all my college roommates, they, they, they stop me. It's like, no, you're making a huge mistake. You know, you're going to hurt people because you're going to be the worst dentist ever. <laughs> and so they encouraged me to apply to art school. My friends were, they, 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 they encouraged me to apply to art school because they knew how much I loved art. And so, you know, it was like something that it was very, like for me, just to go against my parents and do what I wanted, like that sounded insane. But I did just to see if I could get in. But once I realized I, I got in, like then I was hooked. But prior to that, my parents never let me take art class to detract me from the true dream of being a doctor someday, right? Um, so I ended up going to art school. Two and a half years later, you know, I'm out in the world. And I remember just, I, I, I remember being terrified because I just went through two and a half years and I'm an artist. I, you know, this tuition, this huge tuition bill that my parents agreed to pay for, like you be called a doctor, you know, with the amount of tuition money they spent. My first job was in the video game industry. So I was making video games for Activision. Worked there for seven years. Turned out I hate making video games. Uh, had a cartoon show on Disney Channel, The Replacements. Turned out I hate Disney executives. Uh, that, was for, that was for three seasons. And then I fell into children's books because I, what I really learned was that I love storytelling. And I think by the end of it all, I think I realized that I loved, I, I, I think I consider myself a writer who happens to know how to draw. I think that's the conclusion that I came up with. Um, how about you? How did you get started? Well, you okay, so when I, well, when I was the age of uh, a lot of you sitting here, I'm talking about the younger ones, um, I, I love to read so much. I mean, I was one of those readers where I would be so into a book that time would just fly by and, and, and you look up and you don't know what has happened because it's gotten dark in the room. And I remember, I specifically remember that was one time I went into the library and I looked at all the books on the shelves and I thought, okay, I was about 10 years old. I thought somebody has to write these books, but I mean, we didn't have events like this where you could see real life authors and, and I'm really old, so we didn't have computers where you could Google someone. So I thought that authors were dead people, right? I mean, I never saw one in real life. So I thought, okay, we're gonna need someone who's alive to write the new books. And then the next time an adult said to me, what do you wanna be when you grow up? I said, I wanna be a lawyer. I know, I know. It's, it's like, like, he's going to be a doctor, I'm going to be a lawyer. Um, but, but I was too... You chose to be a lawyer. You're I like, I want to be a lawyer. No, there was that, never a point in my life where I said, I, I want to be a doctor. I said that because it made the adults happy. Right. You know, my right. parents were like, oh, you're going to be a lawyer. I'm like, I'm going to be a lawyer. Right. You know, because I was afraid there's to say it. There's a lot of patients, there's a lot of parents out there that are like, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. stop talking, stop talking right now. You know. But um, I was too afraid to, to say out loud that I wanted to be an author because I thought, like, I'm gonna jinx it, or what if what if people laughed at me? You know, what if they made fun of me? I didn't think I could take it. So I guess it is harder as a writer to say I want to be a writer. I want to be. Yeah. When you're a kid growing up and you draw really well, everyone's like, you should be an artist. Yeah, but nobody watches. Nobody watches. Right. Yeah. 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 And then, and then like, I, you're I, I, I went to college. I was about to graduate, and I decided that I couldn't go through with that. I needed to. I needed to write, so I became a writer. But I noticed I didn't say I became an author. I became a writer. Those are two different things. An author writes books. A writer writes anything with words. How many of you have heard of a magical place called Red Lobster? Okay, you, I mean, not to brag, but you are looking at the person who wrote the Red Lobster menus. Okay, so, I mean, I became a writer, and so, I mean, I wrote menus. <laughs> Red Lobster, golden fried shrimp, that was me. So, I mean, so I'm like not writing books, but I'm writing menus, which is a story beginning, middle, end. It's a menu is a story. And so then I wrote television commercials, which is also a story. I worked for Disney. I was I was writing um embarrassing TV. Is a story. Red, it is a story. You read it. You read the beginning, the middle, and then oh it's the dessert. No. I mean I will say you won over many of the hearts of the girls that I gave in high school. Yeah. You know? Enjoy that King of Neptune's beast. Right? Yeah. 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 So, I mean, I did that. That was my career for a long time. And then I 
I realized that I was being a hypocrite because I was telling my own kids, you know, if you have a dream or there's something that you really want, you have to try. And here I was. I had this dream from when I was a kid. So wait, they know I have a degree in microbiology. What was your degree in? Uh, I had a dual degree in um, humanities and English. But we do nothing with our... Well, you no, know, I mean, no, you do something with your degree. Yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. I know how to punctuate. No, I saw, I saw this yeah. statistic. Uh, no, I saw this yeah. statistic. I actually saw this statistic that... Uh, 85% of college degrees go on you. Like someone, they all do something else unrelated to their degree. Yeah. It's 85%, like it's a huge. But, but an English degree yeah. is really great because you're always writing things and it's communication. I never so. thought I would be a writer. Um, and not, not just because like my parents were blocking, you know, blocking me in the way, but I, you know, that, I never, I didn't like to read. I didn't, I wasn't, I wasn't a reader. I wasn't very good at English. See, I, I lived know. at the library, and, yeah. and my mom did too. My parents were teachers. But I remember calling my parents, and uh, I wanted to tell them that I wasn't going to go to law school, that I was going to be a lawyer. And how were they about that? Well, uh, so I, <laughs> I called my mom answers, and moms instinctively know when something's wrong. Yeah. Because I said, there's something important I have to tell you, and... Kids, if you ever say that to the adults in your house, they're going to freak out. So you just try it. It's kind of fun. But anyway, so I said, I said, there's something important I have to tell you. And my mom's like, okay, what is it? And I said, um, I'm not going to go to law school. I don't want to be a lawyer. And there was silence. And I felt so bad because I thought I broke my parents' hearts because they were like, you're going to be this great lawyer. And they help me pay for college and all this kind of stuff. And um, my mom said, there's something I want to tell you. And I thought, okay, if she's going to get mad at me, that's fine because I basically lied to her all these years. What a what a warm up! I have something I want to tell I want you. To have something you go to first. Tell. And then, well, my mom said to me, she said, "You know, your father and I, we never wanted you to be a lawyer. This is so exciting. We thought that's what you wanted to do. Tell me, what do you want to do? I said, I'll be a writer." And then the silence. <laughs> and then my mom's like, "How are you gonna make a living being a writer?" I'm like, "I don't know." That's so. Like one of the hot things. Now. Like, how are you going to make a living? I don't know, but well, I mean, what I've read, like, writing is, like, a big thing now. Well, I mean, every, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at all you guys. A lot of you have writing on your shirts. You know, a writer had to write that. Any, any time you see words, you know, like, I, I wrote packages for, in the, you know, boxes of heating instructions and stuff like that at the grocery store. I've always, you know, well, I mean, I've always, that. so many times I've always told people that, you know, the thing that you're passionate about, that doesn't feel like work, it's probably going to be the thing that you're the best at. And that's probably going to be the thing that you end up doing. So I, like my college roommate, he ended up getting a, a, a degree in English and Latin. And now he works cybersecurity at the FBI, you know, because he loved building computers and all that. So it was like, it was went and got a college degree just to have something that he thought was practical. But I, I realized uh, right now, because there's all these people, that you and I both met at a crossroads in our careers. Because, uh, well, I mean, like, because neither one of us was published when we met. Right. And we both wanted to create books. And there's just that horrible insecurity that you have where you're thinking, like, can I do this? Yeah. And it, yeah. it takes a long time to get through. Well, and we all we both had other jobs, too. Before right. That. So it was like, like trying to, for me, trying to be an author was going to be like a risk. But it's like, OK, can I always go back to my I other I think there's always a risk in that kind of field, yeah. you know, with, with writing. but. I mean, what's great about being a writer, some of the perks about being a writer is that you get to meet some of those other writers that live in other parts of the country that, you know, you're, you're fans of or you admire. And like just just recently, we were in Austin uh, during the school visit, and there's a there's a wonderful author by the name of Christina Suntornbach. We spoke at her kid's school and she showed up and it was just great to see her, you know. But now I have a bunch of friends that I get to see maybe once or twice a year. Uh, at conferences or, you know, whatever book events well, that they're coming if you, if you go to my website, just lisaee.com, um, I have a peep that I, that I just use in my purse somewhere. But I have this yellow peep that, that I take with me. And there are pictures of her with about 200 famous authors. So you can go there and you can see your, your probably your favorite authors holding, holding this peep. And so it's really cool because you get to, you get to meet them. But okay, so like, what were we talking about before? We were talking about I gave you descriptions of the misfits, right? And then you figured out what they were going to look like. So yeah, so I, I get about six months to work on a project like this, and this, this book has about 30, 32 black and white illustrations. Um, 
And it varies, you know, sometimes I'll get a project that requires it to be in color, full color. This one, you know, it's just black and white. Um, I get to read the manuscript like a year before everybody else does, so I can figure out, you know, where, you know, what I have to draw in particular. And sometimes you work with an art director that will leave a spot in the design of the manuscript that tell you like, oh, we should do this illustration for this particular scene. Um, but when it came to when, when it came to drawing the characters, you know, um, some things that I was mindful of was. Listen, I got to make sure that the kids dress cool, not like what I wore in the 1990s. Not right? what like, we're wearing today. They all be wearing you know? bonnet shirts, <laughs> you know? Yeah, so so I'd be very mindful of that. I'd be looking through Urban Out's perfect catalog. I'd be, you know, going to see what my kids are wearing and like what their friends are wearing and things like that. Um, and I would, yeah, I would go online and I would just take a screen grab of like cool fashion trends. And so one of my favorite characters actually is Phil, because you know, she's got this really great bomber jacket with patches all over it, uh, things like that. Um, you know, all of the main character, all of, you know, Lisa in, in the description says that she wore vintage clothing. Well, I have her in a, in, in a black leather jacket, uh, but, but I made it a point also to take the term vintage and, and kind of uh, integrate, you know, some of, my, some of my passions, you know, so like I was a big, I loved going to concerts when I was a kid. So I have like all these old concerts of all these old bands. So when you go to the when you go to the book, she's always wearing a different concert shirt. You know, uh, one store, one bookstore uh, manager in Chicago, you know, messaged me and he said, "Is is she wearing a bad religion shirt?" And I said, "Yeah, I love bad religion." So you know, now she's wearing a bad religion shirt. Uh, there was another kid. There was like a little kid in Austin who uh, who asked. He was just like, "Oh, could you could you make a shout out to Pink Floyd?" Yeah. And I was like, "You know what? I'll be happy to Pink, do that." Pink for Floyd you. will be in the next book. No, but I looked. I looked at oh. the one where they're walking in the street. Oh, Debbie, you already did? Already had, she already had the and you forgot? Shirt. I completely forgot. Yeah, I completely forgot. <laughs> okay. you know, so I'm sure at some point in the future, there'll be like, no doubt shirts. Well, and, and, and people, like, people like always ask us, like, how do you work together? We don't. I mean, we do, but we don't. So like, it's well, like. we respect each other's Well, space, the know? thing is like, when I'm writing. Like a super team. We're a super team. We're like. Like spy. Like, reading each other's minds, but uh, we've done a couple other books together, but the thing is that I am so familiar with with Dan and who he is and how he draws, that when I'm writing, I'll be writing a scene and I can actually imagine what he's gonna do with it. And I'll be thinking, okay, he's gonna have so much fun with this. And so I know that when I hand over the manuscript, um, he's just gonna actually take it to the next level. So our first book that we did, did together was Bobby vs. Girls. Yeah, based on uh, my son. Yeah, and I was looking back, I was looking back at the old artwork back then, and I, it just made me cringe a little bit. It was, oh, it was in the bucket of I'm yuck. not gonna tell my son that it you said a, that. It was in the bucket of yuck, but yeah. like, I looked at it, and I compared it to the work that I did now, and here's the thing. Kid, that was like, like, what, maybe uh, 12, 15 years ago? Something, something like that, but yeah. here's the thing, like, if you look back at your old work, and it makes you cringe, like, that's a good sign, actually, because that means you've improved, you know? So like right now, like I'm bald, I'm completely bald. You're and bald? Look, and I look at old, I look at old like photos of me when I was a kid and I had the worst haircuts. And it was just one of those things where you're like, you know what, I didn't even deserve to have hair. <laughs> because all those years where I could have had like this cool haircut, it's just wasted, it's just wasted. And like a dandelion coming with my and all my hair. Well, I think, I think that like maybe, like maybe 15 years ago, like bald became really chic, right? I mean, like, yeah, you can think people, like people Jason that, Statham. People that didn't have to be bald wanted to be bald because yeah. it looked cool. Bruce Willis. It, you I, go back and you watch old Bruce Willis movies where he has hair and it looks weird. And my wife said that to me. She's like, you've been bald, bald for so long. Like, when I see old pictures of you with hair, it looked weird. But we, we were friends when he had full head hair. Yeah. But I saved thousands on shampoo. That's so great. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, uh, let's see. Do we want to talk a little bit about... I don't know if you want to say. Oh. Uh, or, or do we need to wait on notes? I think we're supposed to wait on it because it's okay. a secret. But what happens in book one? So you have these five misfits, right? And they're solving the crime of the century because the, the world's most expensive necklace 
has been stolen. It's been stolen at a fundraiser at their school. And if they don't find it, their school is going to go under. And so they're going to take all this training and stuff that they've had, and it's all going to come together. But it's really chaotic, and it's it's the book is a mystery, and it's a detective story, and it's a thriller, and it's really fast-paced, and it's silly, and it's like, you know, so much stuff is happening all at once, and then it ends with a cliffhanger. Right. And that cliffhanger is going to be book two, which I finished two weeks ago. Do you remember? Okay, so we were having this discussion maybe a month or two back because. I had gone to a jewelry exhibit at the Natural History Museum in Los Angeles, and they showed, they had on display, uh, it was this, it was this diamond, it was like this huge diamond, like, probably, probably the size of this post-it, right, it was enormous, right, and it was called the Yonker, and um, we go in there, and I just, I kind of wanted to see what a huge, you tried to steal it, didn't you? I went in there, they had a security yeah. guard, and, and, you know, of course, everybody was like, so what, what would you say the thing's worth? And he's like, about $25 million. This one thing is worth $25 million, right? And I guess the thing is that, like, like when you have diamonds that size, they're not typically, like, found on the ground. Like, look at this huge diamond. They're, like, cut from a much bigger diamond. So the Yonker was, like, one part of this giant diamond that had been cut into seven pieces. So, you know, I don't know. Maybe in the future... Oh, the the diamond will have like a sister diamond or something. It will. Like it could. It could do that. You never know. I mean, the thing is, like, when I'm writing the books, um, I always write my endings first, so I know how they're going to end. But I don't know how I'm going to get there. Right. And so I'm writing, and stuff starts happening. There are there are a lot of cats in the book. I mean, a lot, a lot of cats. I was very allergic to cats when I was a kid. I still am very allergic to cats. So there's a lot of cats, and I thought, okay, well, what if I had like like a, a kitty con convention of cats and that's part of the setting and then what if later we have a lot of dogs in the book you know so i mean it's like it's really fun because you're sitting there alone in your office and you're coming up with all these ideas and they're being bounced around and you have to like meet them together and i like drawing cats and, he, and he's and dan is excellent at drawing cats yeah. and dogs too you're good at dogs yeah, no, I, I like drawing dogs. But not but cats, horses. Cats are like more fun. I don't know why. You I'm not a dog horses. person, yeah. but I, I like drawing cats more. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. So does anyone have some questions for us? Yes. How did I get into writing? I, okay, so I told you like my mom was a teacher, right? And so when I was really little, every night before bed, she'd read to me. And then she was so tired because teachers work so hard that sometimes she would fall asleep. And I loved it because then I got to stay up and read, right? And then um, the very first story I ever wrote, I was eight years old, and it was about a giant sweet potato and a tiny farmer. And it was horrible. It was horrible. I wrote it for my little brother. Um, it never got published, obviously. But the thing was, I kept writing. I kept writing and writing after that. And you know how I was telling you before, um, like, I wish I had told people that um, I wanted to be a writer, but I was too embarrassed. I, I wish I had told like my teachers or my librarian or my friends or my parents because I think I would have been a published author a lot sooner had I not been so afraid. I think about that though sometimes. Like, had I not gone to a four-year college and got a degree I don't use, would it would it have been better? And I, I don't necessarily know. I don't, well, microbiology is actually really good. I I think for drawing. Well, my wife's a scientist, so she comes yeah. home from work at Caltech, and then she tell me about her trouble from the lab, and I can totally be like, oh, I totally understand. The Western, the Western blob just wasn't working that day, right? The conditions were wrong. Maybe the, maybe the contaminants were in there, and like, the whole sample destroyed. Like, I can actually understand what she's saying. But if there's, any, if there's anything I gained from a, a microbiology degree was that I know that I'm capable of earning something that I never wanted. You know? So then when I went to art school, when I went to art school and I got a degree in art, I just, it just, I made me realize how much I actually love art. No, you're you're absolutely right because uh, one of the jobs I had was I was an account exec for Chef Up Foods at Dole Dane Birnbach, a big advertising agency, and I handled like their marketing and stuff. And I wore a suit every day, and I went to the office with a suit, and I hated it. Right. And so I hated it so much, and and uh, now that I don't have to wear a suit every day, I'm very grateful or what I get to do for a living. Well, what's the convenience that now this world has, they say, prevented business casual, which would have well, been, been handy casual. back in the I day. Wore, I had like this three-piece suit that I wore, and I, ca I carried a briefcase, and 
Oh, I just wear the lemon pants, they're the best. Yeah, I mean, so like now, we, you know, like, for work, going to my office is like getting out of bed and walking into the next room, which is filled with toys. Get, again, if you go to my website, you'll see my office, and it's like full, sitting to floor of toys and books. And, um, and that's my research, that's, what, that's my office, that's, you know. She, um, so she used to, she used to uh, have, she would collect all kinds of little trinkets and, and just knickknacks. And I remember she had to, she had to watch my kid one day, and then he came out with just a big box of just like little plastic spiders and little <laughs> bands. And I'm like, okay. Yeah. I know, I know. I, I love like toys and stuff. Yeah. Wilson, a friend of ours, gave, gave me like 500 little ducks. So you know what I did with them? I put them all over town. <laughs> That's all littering. <laughs> <laughs> no, I set them free. I set them free. Um, another question for us. Who has another question for us? Yes, the boy in the block. How do, okay, how do I get the idea of writing the ends first? I don't know. I mean, it kind of hits me in the head. I mean, um, I guess I'll be thinking overall about a book. Like for The Misfits, I thought, okay, um, stuff's going to happen, but at the very end, well, I can't say because you're going to read it, but um, this will happen, and then I write that down, and then as I'm writing everything else, it has to make sense so that it comes to that. And um, you know what? I don't know. That's a great question. I don't know how I come up with the ending, but well, that's that's what it I mean, starts I can, with. I can relate. Like sometimes yeah. you just have like really great scenes. You have great ideas for scenes. But you, but you don't know what you're going to do with it. Right. So it's kind of like a puzzle where you're trying to figure out, oh, maybe it can come in the beginning of the story. Maybe it can come in the I mean, I've come up with random scenes that would end up somewhere in the middle. Yeah. Right? And then and then you're just kind of, there's some, there's some writers that actually write scenes on postcards. I used to do that. Right, and then they'll just move the postcards around to rearrange it to see how it all plays out, how the flow works I out. used to do that. When I first started, because I had been doing like the TV stuff, I would write things on index cards and I would put it on the ground and I would walk around my right. story. Right, right, right. Um, but now, you know, with computers and everything, I use a program called Scribner. Right. And I do write an outline. Remember I was telling you guys about like Red Lobster, beginning, middle, end, it's a story. That's all an outline is, a beginning and a middle and an end. So every book has a beginning and a middle and an end. So I already know the structure yeah. of the I mean, story. The only, the only important thing I can add to that is if, you're ha if you have a scene, there has to be a reason that it's in the story. It can't just right. be there for no reason. Like, right. That has to give some important plot. I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a phrase that, that writers use all the time. It's like, kill your darlings. Yeah. And by that, it means like, maybe you have a scene and something's happened and you just love it, but if you took it out, the book would be stronger and you have to get rid of that stuff that, that sometimes you love because it's not serving the story. Right, right. Why don't yeah. you pick someone? Uh, any other questions? You, sir, yes, in the white. Uh, so, okay, so well, why a jewel heist? Why, why, a, why a jewel heist? Um, again, I don't know. <laughs> You're welcome, Alex. No, I, so I was thinking about, well, I was probably thinking about some old movies because I knew it was going to be set in Alcatraz, which is this high security prison. I was probably, there's a movie called To Catch a Thief. It's a very old movie with Cary Grant and um, Grace Kelly, and it's about a jewel thief. And so I think I was kind of in that mindset. But you know, I mean, these are great questions that you're asking because Sometimes when you're coming up with ideas, it's like something little from this gets in your brain and something from over there, and then it starts like, it's kind of like when you're baking a cake, it all gets mixed up together, and then at the end you have it, but in the beginning, you, you didn't even know what ingredients were going to be there, and I think it was, it was probably that. I guess generally the impression of spies and you know, things like that is that they're, they're typically there to save, save the world, which well, I mean, we, we haven't... We haven't touched on that yet, but they do have these abilities where they well, could potentially Well, yeah, so the world. kids, the misfits, are super secret crime fighters. So they're not necessarily spies. So their mission is to solve crimes and to protect citizens. Okay. Um, yeah, just to, to go back, like when I was trying to reference ideas for this, I was looking at the A-Team and the Mod Squad, uh, you know, things like that. Just even like, I don't know if you guys remember an old show called 3 to one Contact. Do you remember the Bloodhound Gang? Yeah. Okay. Silence. All right. Yeah. right. It was great. 
Yeah, but like shows like that, even Scooby Doo, even Scooby Doo. Oh, Scooby Doo, yeah, right, yeah, and right. it's it's always the you always know it's gonna be uh, another question. Yes. Okay. She said if I if I if I wasn't a writer, what job would I have? I would probably want to make jewelry. I mean, I just I just like making things. It would be something. But if I wanted to make a living. Uh, I'd, I'd probably be a lawyer. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. Maybe a teacher because that's what my parents were. But, um, yeah. Wow. I, I'm glad I'm a writer. <laughs> Thank you. What would you if you weren't an artist? I like I like I like I like making furniture. Actually, I don't know if that counts as an art. I, you know, but I do like. I, that's I like different than drawing. You're not drawing the furniture. I like making like like furniture. furniture. Uh, I also roast my own coffee. I think I'd I'd like to probably be a coffee. He person. is a coffee snob. I'm a, I am a coffee snob. You're looking at a coffee snob. Starbucks is like battery. I use instant that. coffee, right. and he yells at me. And then the other the other thing I probably would do like um, maybe sports medicine. You know. Like being a physical therapist or something, because like the Staples Arena is only 20 minutes away, and I have a friend that works at the Staples Arena. Like, it'd be great to be like a physical therapist for the LA Kings or, or some the Lakers. That'd be fun. Not actually be out there like trying to put 20 points a game. <laughs> oh, do you need a band aid for that? <laughs> He's a nice guy. Yeah. Yeah. J.K. Rowling. Yeah. 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 Um, well, so I got pulled out of so so the way I got discovered for writing is um, I, I I knew I wanted to be an author and I went to the library and I got a book called Children's Book Market or something. Yeah, it's still and, in publication. They do them yeah. every year. And yeah. then there was an article about Arthur Levine, the editor of Harry Potter stories, and I thought he looked like a nice man. So I, I sent him uh, what's called a query letter. It's, it's just this one letter, it's one page saying what you're writing. And so I sent him this query letter and he liked the query letter. He thought it was really funny. And he said, but the book that you're pitching me is not right for me. Do you have another, do you have another book? I said, oh, I have this idea about this girl who's a genius. And uh, she's, you know, she's this super genius and she's in college. And he said, well, send me the book. And I said, okay, but I know you're really busy with Harry Potter and everything. So what if I sent you a synopsis, which is like a paragraph or so about it in the first three chapters? And he said, send that to me. And I sent it to him and he calls me and he says, I love this. Send me the rest of the book. And I said, I haven't written the rest of the book. <laughs> and um, that book took me six years to write, but he stuck with me for the six years. And so that ended up being Girls and Girl Genius, my, my very first novel. And then later, I remember, like, when I was writing another book, he's, he's like, you know, you have, to, you have to read this series, you know, it was Harry Potter. I'm like, ah, uh, that's really not my, uh, you know, the fantasy, I don't know. And oh, oh my gosh, it was just like, you know, but both of my kids got to meet J.K. Rowling. And actually, my daughter, who's a children's book editor, got to work on one of her books. And so... Yeah, I mean, that whole thing changed the, the industry. Thank you. Oh, about my, how I met Arthur? So I, I joined this, uh, I don't know if there's any children's uh, book writer people who are interested. There's an organization called SCBWI, uh, Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators. So it's scbwi.org. And uh, basically for like, what, 65 bucks, you can join the society for- I think it costs more now, I think it's like 85. Is that right? Okay. Yeah. And so they'll have, the, they have chapters all over the country. There's a, the, like one of the biggest ones is in Austin. I think there's one here in Houston. I'm sure there is, yeah. Right. yeah. And they'll That'd invite editors and art directors and agents to come and they'll, they'll critique your work and things like that. They have two big conferences, uh, one in LA, one in New York. And, and one year I decided to go to the LA one uh, with a portfolio and a dummy book for my first picture book idea. And I and, they, and on Saturday, they would have this big like art portfolio show. And so I, I put my portfolio down and my dummy book down. And then, you know, like maybe two or three hours later, it was judged and everybody's walking in. And there was like all this chatter. There was like all this chatter. You could just, you'd, like, you'd just see people like looking at you and like, pointing at you and stuff like that. And then Arthur Levine comes up with my dummy book. He had snatched it off the table, which I didn't want anybody else to see it. 
And Arthur Levine came up to me and he's like, I'm, I'm Arthur Levine. And, and I was so green, I didn't even know who he was. You know, and I was just like, oh, that's nice, you know? And, and, and he says, oh, I, I'd, like to, I'd like to take this, I'd like to take this manuscript back to Scholastic. I'd like to give you a two book deal. And, and the way it works back in the day was that traditionally what you would do, you would promise a manuscript to an, uh, to an editor and then you would let them have the first look at it and then you would wait for them to say yes or no and then they would give it back to you. And so I had already promised the manuscript to somebody else. And so I'm looking at, I'm looking at Arthur and I said, oh, well, thank you, but uh, I can't let you have that because I promised to another editor. Of course, he's like the most powerful man in publishing at the time. And he remember being looked confused at me, like, like okay, I'm ready to give you money right now, but if that's how you want to play this, then he gives me his card. And I remember he walked away just totally defeated and my art teacher from art school, like she comes up and she grabs my arm. Like I was a child that like broke something at a grocery store. And she, I remember she like grabbed my arm. Like, what are you doing? Like she was so mad. Like I was like, okay, you know? <laughs> and she's like, what are you doing? And I said, I did what you taught me, you know? And she's like, do you know who that man is? And I forgot his name already. Like, you know, I'm like looking at the car and I'm like, Arthur Levine. You know, she's like, do you know what Arthur Levine does? And I said, hey, like what? Like what? She's like, he edits Harry Potter. And I'm like, what have I done? <laughs> and they're like, yeah, go back, go back, take the deal, take the deal. And then that's that's how that's. I don't have I don't have one of those stories where it's like, oh, I submitted to like a thousand publishers and got rejected because of I just met the most powerful man in publishing and got super. <laughs> so, so when sometimes you know when I when I teach writing at, at colleges, I say there are three things that that if you have these three things. I guarantee you'll make it. If you have two, you have a good chance. If you have one, you may. If you don't have any of them, I don't know if you will. Get your notes and that is um, talent, luck, and smarts. And I felt like, like, I felt like I had the talent and I had the luck. I didn't have the smarts. You know, because I didn't, right. I didn't know right. all about the business and stuff. And it sounds like you had the same thing. Yeah. So you're looking at two very dumb people. Why do you <laughs> Security making over prepared for that day. Yeah. You know, just with the portfolio and everything. Uh, yeah, well, so, so I think one of the big things that people stumble on is that they don't know the rules of publishing. Like a picture book, for example. Like I'm, I'm sure the majority of you don't know that a picture book is supposed to be 32 pages, right? That is 85% of why most people just get thrown out. Like, oh, the word count is 5,000 words when you're, you realize, like, these days, word count for a manuscript should probably be like around 1,200 or less. For a picture know? book. Yeah, so for a picture book. And so sometimes they'll just look at it, they'll know right off the bat, like this person doesn't even know how the format of a picture book is. And that's like a big reason why a lot of people don't get published, that they just don't know. Right, yeah, right. So. Uh, another question. Um, yes. So the question is, do you work on multiple projects um, at the same time of the year, yes, um, especially that guy. But but yes, like right now, I'm working on three books, three novels, and, and they're all at different stages. And I, uh, yeah. okay, I'm going to uh, let you I, answer that. Cause... I'm, I'm working on like seven right now. So I've got I've got my own graphic. I've got two my own graphic novels. I've got but like the other ones I'm illustrating. I'm illustrating. I'm working on the next Misfits. Uh, I'm, I'm finishing up another book that I just did with Henry Winkler. Uh, I've, I've just finished a book with uh, my good friend Mo Willems. Uh, and then I have three others that are just waiting, like, come on, you know. <laughs> Do my art, you know, and getting all these emails from the editor. It, it's all, they're all on top. Yeah, constantly yeah. juggling, nonstop, but, you know, it's, it's um, nice to know the work. Sir, in the back? Yes. 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 Um, it's funny you talked about graphic novels. Yeah. Because I saw the illustrations and they're very cool. Yes. You know, when I was growing up, uh -huh. you know, it was all about comics. Yes. It's like all graphic novels now. Right? Marvel. Like everybody sees those. I was the same way, yeah. They were all comics. Yeah. So I'm just wondering if there's any thoughts, maybe you mentioned the misfit, a graphic novel, a comic book, or, or more money, a video game. Um, uh, that both would be lovely. Yeah, I mean, so like we're open right now i mean that it, it's a the, so the misfits is a novel but it's illustrated and i think it lends itself i think you're right it really yeah. because of all the action and stuff but for now we're going to focus on the novels but right. 
But who knows? I mean, a lot of times that will happen with a series. They'll start out as a novel, but then yeah. they'll turn into a comic right, or a graphic right. novel. That's a big trend these days. And then people we're, like, like I, said, we're very I don't know if I have now. the time or the patience to actually do it. Graphic novels take a long time. They do take a long time. Like, my last graphic novel took me three and a half years. Uh, I had another one took 11, and like my first one took seven. Not because it takes 11 or seven years to make a graphic novel, but because I'm so busy juggling so many interim projects that when you find time to work on it, then you know you have to devote so much attention to it. I would say on average, for me to do a graphic novel would probably be like two, two and a half years. So how long would you say that took you? This illustration? Yeah. Uh, that, that one illustration took me uh, about two and a half, three hours. Maybe, maybe less. And, and the book, I think, has, what, 30? 30, 32. 32, 32 illustrations. 32 illustrations. Yeah. 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 Okay, why don't you pick some? Uh, yes. Oh, okay. All right. So we're going to give you a little drawing demonstration right now, okay? So I'm going to give you a quick lesson on how to draw. And what you're going to realize is that everybody in this room already possesses the knowledge of how to draw whatever you want, okay? So let's draw a face. I'm gonna draw, I'm gonna draw a very basic face, only using letters of the alphabet, which is, I'm pretty sure, something that everybody can do. But what's gonna end up happening is I'm going to draw one of the character's faces, and then you're gonna see how that relates, okay? So, audience participation, just shout it out. What's a good letter for a head? A. Oh. A. <laughs> All right, so we have a nice round head, right? So. Our imagination can define this in many different ways. Right now, I can say that this is a rock. I can say this is a potato, an egg. But we have to add features. We have to add details, right? So what is a good letter to make some eyes? Well, yeah, basic letter. So yeah, let's do, just do an O, right? So we have two eyes. Now let's do some pupils. What's a good letter for the pupils? Oh, there you go, right? So now we've got a terrified potato, right? Okay. Now we all know our emojis. We all know our emojis. There's different, there's different like numbers and, and signs we can use to make noses. Um, for example, some work like the letter L. Do you see a nose when I make the letter L? Okay. If I take the letter J and I turn it on its side, do you see a, do you see a nose in the letter J? All right. If I draw the letter C, like you got Charlie Brown's nose, right? You could even, you could even like take an upside down U like that and then like give it some nostrils. Now you got a piggy, like a little piggy nose, right? If I wanted to do a bat nose, I could do a heart like that. And then same principle, now you got you know, you know, bat nose, right? So in this case, we're just going to stick with the letter L. Keep it nice and simple, OK? So I've got the letter L right there. And then, you know, when someone mentioned the letter C, so some letters are very versatile. You can, you can do a lot of things with those. So I could use the letter C to make an ear here and an ear here. And we'll even, we'll even take the letter C. We'll take the letter C and we'll make a smile, right? And then we'll make the letter C, and then we'll give it some eyebrows, right? So who did, who did we draw? Who did we draw this now? We drew, we drew me. No. <laughs> Sadly, no, we drew Dwayne Johnson. We drew The Rock. Okay. But if we took, if we took Dwayne Johnson and we gave him some glasses, right? It's, who is this? I'm very flattered now. Uh, this is Stanley Tucci. Okay. But, but if we took Stanley Tucci, if we took Stanley Tucci and gave him some thicker eyebrows, uh, uh, now, it's, now it's New York Times bestselling author Dan Santa, right? And now you all possess knowledge that's completely useless to you. <laughs> all right, so now, so now we know how to make eyes with just letters of the alphabet, right? Now I'm going to draw Olive. I'm going to draw Olive from the book. And you're going to see the same principles, but what I'm basically doing is I'm taking those same letters of the alphabet, but I'm, I'm modifying them. I'm warping them a little bit because, because I want to make more distinguished features, but they're still the same principles, okay? So, for example, with Olive, I'm going to start with her head, which is the letter O, but I'm keeping in mind certain details, like, you know, she has slender cheeks, she has a pointy chin, right? And so, as you can see here, it's the letter O. But there's still a hint of a jawline, there's a hint of a chin, there's a little hint of the brow of her eyes and stuff like that. Now, if I'm gonna make if I'm gonna make eyes, I can still do the letter O, right? But but I don't have to completely draw the letter O. I can I can I can imply it, right? So I'll just do the letter O like so, right? You can still see the letter O, you can still see how the principles relate. 
And then I'm gonna give her, I'm gonna give her some eyebrows and I'm just gonna take like, I'm gonna give her like this stern, concerned look. I'm gonna take the number one and I'm gonna turn it on its side like so. You see that number one? Right? Sorry, it's a little wobbly. But I've got her, I've got her eyebrows. I'm gonna give her some pupils again. Right, I'm gonna have her looking off to the side. And so far, so far, you know, following the same principles, but I'm just kind of doing slight modifications. This comes from you copying comic books, you know, copying, copying X-Men, copying, and drawing noses the way those artists draw those noses. If you want to save $120,000 in art school, just copy pictures, like, that's all they said. It was like, copy things and switch at your work. Like, that's all they said. Right? So, now we're going to make a nose. I'm going to use the letter L for a nose, but a big, a big nose like this would be a very strong nose, would be a very strong, you know, bridge of a nose. So, you know, she's a, she's a, she's a 14 year old girl, very petite. I'm gonna give her a petite little nose, and I'm just going to imply the tip of the nose, but I'm gonna use that letter L like so. Be a tiny little L, like that. So you see a little tip of the nose, and that's something like, that's something that I learned from like copying pictures of anime when I was a kid. So there's a little bit of like Marvel comic in me, there's a little bit of anime in me, and then you just kind of borrow here and there, right? Uh, and then I'm gonna add a, a little nostril there, just a little tiny nostril like so. Anybody can draw this nose, you just have to understand the vocabulary that you need to draw those certain features, right? And a mouth is just a simple line, right? And I'm gonna give her a neck. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give her a neck. But then look, look at this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, make, the, I'm gonna make the collar of the neck right here. So be wearing a t-shirt. And watch this. I'm gonna use the letter A. Watch this letter A. Go right here, right here, and then an A. See how I made that letter A? All these shapes all exist in here. You have all the knowledge of how to do it. Just have to know how to utilize it, right? Now watch this. She, so she's wearing a vintage jacket. So I mean, she has like this double breast. She has like this double breast and collar, right? So I'm actually going to use the letter M. Watch this. Watch this. Letter M for the first collar, and then for the second, like so. But there, you can see the letter M right in there, right? And I'm going to do it on the other side as well. Okay. So I have two letter M's, and then just for the hair, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna. Pull that over her eye. I'm gonna have a stray strand here. Pull that down on the sides, like so. And then, and then you're just filling it in. You're filling the rest in, like so. And so all the characters, they all have their unique features, um, and that just comes with experimentation. And you know, uh, Theo, for instance, in the text, they say that he has freckles uh, and big mommy hair. Uh, and then, you know, in terms of his clothes, I'll be honest with you, I think I was, I was, you know, since he was so laid back and casual, I was thinking of that old show Magnum P.I. I thought he'd look great in like a little hula shirt kind of thing. Um, you know, Phil definitely uh, borrows from like, you know, the urban, urban streetwear that, you know, like my friends and I used to wear when we were younger. Loved collecting patches and things like that. Um, of just things that you're passionate about. And so, you know, that's, that's a quick demonstration on how to draw characters from the book. But I, I promise you that if, if, you're, if you think that you want to look at the artwork and you want to draw some of it, I bet anybody in this room could draw any of those scenes in the book with just a lot of practice. Because I think, you know, a lot of people used to grow up and they would, they would look at me and they'd say, how do you learn to draw? And, and it, it's, it's um, it's not this innate talent, right? It's not something you were just born with. Like I would draw Garfield and it would turn out to be a really gar good Garfield, but a lot of people don't see like the 20 or 30 drawings that I had to get to get to that good drawing. It's like the alphabet, right? We all went into kindergarten. None of us knew how to draw our ABCs, right? But they gave us that line paper and the big fat chubby pencil and we were just drawing letters of the alphabet, and now, you know, now we can make beautiful words with those, but it all comes with practice. Yeah, and I think, I think it's the same with writing, too. You know, I told right. you my first book was about a giant sweet potato. It was terrible. It was a terrible book. Right. But I kept writing, and I kept writing and writing, and I got better as I went along. I, you know, I, yeah. was, I, I guess it was just really stubborn. So I think we have time for, like, one or two more questions. Um, so someone, yes, in the, in the gray. Yeah. She asked like the hardest question in the world, which is what is my favorite book of all time to read? Um, wow. 
Do you like now all of a sudden? I, I, can't, I, can I can't even think of any books. Because <laughs> I'm so stunned. If you, you want a minute? Okay, so my favorite book is by David Sedaris, We Talk Pretty One Day. That's a fantastic book. Uh, another book, another book, like if you're talking about being in the company of people who craft books that you like, oh my God, what I was trying to do when I wrote that. Uh, American Born Chinese by, by Jean Yang. Like that's, that, that to me changed, that literally changed my life because there are pages of that book where deep inside I was like, I didn't realize other Asian dudes were thinking like this. Like it made, it really made me open up and just feel, feel, you know, vulnerable. And, and it was a, it's a beautiful book. So those, but also growing up, it was like, I was a big fan of Encyclopedia Brown, uh, Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs, uh, Jumanji, uh, and yeah, a bunch of, bunch of comic books growing up. I could go off all day about comic books. Yeah, so I mean, I love like Walk Two Moons by Sharon Creech, but when I was a kid, the book that I read the most was called um, Honestly Katie John, about this misunderstood tomboy. And um, I remember because I felt like I was a misunderstood tomboy, and then just about 15 years ago, I wrote an article about it because I thought that Mary Calhoun probably had passed away because you know, I read the books when I was a kid. She read the article. And um, and we met at the train station, and we became pen pals. And I brought all of my Katie John books why? with me at San Juan Capistrano. But why? Because she was living there. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. No, because we just picked the train station. <laughs> You're like, you the train station for. And and I told her that when I was a kid, I loved the book so much. I thought that um, when I became a mom, if I had a daughter, my daughter was going to be named Katie. And so I had her sign books for my daughter Katie because um, my daughter is named after that literary Let's character. See. I had a big crush on Leah Thompson, the actress. And my so, wife's name is Leah. <laughs> okay, well, to say. Dan, why don't, you, why don't you pick the last question? Uh, uh, orange shirt, sir. What is my favorite drawing? Um, oh, my favorite drawing technique. Oh boy, that's a good one. Uh, I, I definitely like just working with mine. Like, I think, I think my strength comes in just generating like really nice thin lines and, and just building up the form with that. I'm an okay painter. Paint, painting is pretty much like drawing, but you have to really, you have to really change your, your thinking process because then you're, you're creating giant shapes, you know? But everything, everything really relies on one thing and that is generating contrast. The, the, the movement between light and dark, generating effects of light and dark, either with line or with paint. I'm definitely like a line person, and I like I like really thin line work, like uh, yeah, like see see the little shading I'm putting like right there in the calves. I could I could just do that all day, just creating like volume, just with like hash marks and things like that. Like that's the kind of stuff. I grew up like a big fan of. There was anime like uh, Katsuhiro Tomo, who did this great comic called Akira. The other ones like Ghost in the Shell, uh, Masamune Shiro. Like a lot of those Japanese like brush ink artists, they were huge influences on me. So that's that's uh, that's, that's a little bit about my life. If you have any other questions, feel free to ask like afterwards. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.